So let's talk for just a minute about why you would even outsource or offshore. What's the logic behind it? And the way you can understand it is through the theory of transaction cost economics. It was an idea uh, put forward by Oliver Williamson. Um, I don't make my students normally read the article, but I'll put the reference in the um, summary piece of the, uh, of the YouTube video so you can look it up if you want. It's kind of math heavy, and I'm going to kind of summarize it uh, in layman's terms for you. So the theory is what we call transaction cost economics. So transaction cost economics actually doesn't really have anything to do with um, outsourcing or offshoring per se, but it is very germane to understanding outsourcing and offshoring. So transaction cost economics answers a very basic question. Is it cheaper to produce a certain good or service within the firm or to search for those goods and services in the marketplace? So our friends in economics, neoclassical economics, say that you can always achieve or get the best possible price in the open marketplace. So if you want to buy milk or something like that, your best bet for find, finding milk is if you look hard and far enough, somewhere in the marketplace you will find eventually that lowest price or greatest quality of milk available. But Oliver Williamson points something out that's very important. It takes time to identify who has that best cost uh, price of milk and it takes time to negotiate a contract with those different buyers. So let me draw out a firm. Um, we'll just make a fictionalized firm. Let's uh, use a matrix style organization structure. So I'll refer to this also in our corporate governance video. But you know at the top you've got your CEO. Okay. And you've got your board of directors. Let's call that BOD. That's not BOD, it's board of directors. And of course, the board of directors represent the interests of shareholders. Shareholders are owners, depending on how you wish to pitch it, right? right. So, from here, you typically have the CEO has their executive staff. Okay. That would be people like your uh, CFO, chief financial officer, uh, COO, your ops person, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. And below that, also answering to the CEO. Have a variety of subunits. All right? And these subunits would be what we would call strategic business units. <coughs> Sometimes they're known as SBU. Okay. A strategic business unit is a sub organization within a large corporation that can usually produce a variety of goods or services for the overall corporation on its own or independently. Okay. So think about a car company, right? You still got your CEO, board, directors, all this stuff is the same, but you know, a car company might have a strategic business unit that makes tires. Uh, one that's in charge of making windshields, um, roofs, seats, steering chassis, etc., etc. Okay. Now, the question that the leadership of a firm has to ask, am I better off producing the goods or services necessary for this firm within the organization itself, or should I search for those things in an open market? Am I better off outsourcing the production cost of tires to some sort of an outside supplier? And so there's a tension 
that you have to resolve. Okay? Yes, it is true that when you go out in the market, you can get the best possible price for whatever that good or service is. But there is a cost of searching. It takes time to search for that ideal supplier. And of course, you can look on the internet and say, bam, I know uh, Joe's Tire Shop in you know, Country X or State X can make those tires for me. So let's say you choose Joe's Tire Shop in Country X. It's going to take time to um, negotiate a contract with Joe's Tire Shop and ensure that Joe produces a quality product that your customers will enjoy. There was one auto manufacturer, I'm not going to name it, that decided to take all their strategic business functions, or a large majority of them, and outsource them all. What you wound up happening at this car company is they got all the stuff put back together, they got all the, the different parts, and you had issues like the steering wheel didn't fit in the chassis, the tires uh, didn't fit on the axles, and all this kind of stuff. So it brings up an important point. So the fact that um, they didn't have all the stuff that, that worked together. They gave up a degree of control by not producing these items in house. Okay, so that's an additional cost. That's related to search cost, or that's related to search cost. Now, on the other hand, you can produce these items in house because it seems obvious. Well, you don't have to pay the search costs, and you won't have to give up control, right? Well, if you do these things in house, you engage. You have a firm that engages in what is known as satisficing behavior. Those of you that are familiar with Taylor, he called this soldiering. Satisficing behavior means that you perform not at the optimal level for the market, but you perform only well enough basically not to get fired. So the market, you'll get the best possible price because uh, different firms are competing for your business. Within a firm, the managers operate only well enough to keep their jobs. So they get kind of lazy and they would produce goods at a higher cost or a higher price than what you could get in the market. Okay, So what winds up happening is your overall cost of production is equal to the materials cost plus the labor plus the satisficing cost plus the search cost. So, let's pretend for a second that I own an American automobile manufacturer. Okay? And I can produce tires within my own firm. How would I calculate the true finalized cost of producing tires? Let's say, how much does the rubber and all that cost? How much does my more expensive American labor cost? How much more am I going to have to pay because my um, employees are getting soft because they don't have to be as competitive because they know they've already got a job? And then how much are the search costs? Well, fortunately, because it's produced within my own firm, the search costs are almost non-existent. Okay? And then the search, as I mentioned, you can also look at this as cost of control. Or value of control. Again, which is relatively negligible because you already control everything because it's, oper it's operating within your own firm. Okay, so let's say I outsource to whatever your favorite developing country is. I can say, well, the materials are cheaper. The labor is cheaper. Satisficing cost does not necessarily exist because I have found the best price in the market. But how long is it going to take me to find that ideal supplier? It may take months, and you know, time is money. And... How valuable to me is it to have total control over produ production? They may produce tires, 
but the fact that I've given up control, they will produce tires in a way that they see fit, even though they are trying to meet our intent. They will produce tires their way. And of course, giving up that cost of control may mean that when I get those tires, they don't fit on my um, car axles, or they don't meet American safety standards, or all sorts of problems. Okay? Or what if I've given up the cost of control to a labor contractor in a foreign country, we talked about this during multinationals, and they abuse their workers and the media finds out and then there's a lawsuit okay, under the Alien Tort Claims Act. Well, that has a cost too. And so when you look at this total transit cost of transaction, then you have to ask yourself, is it really better to outsource or offshore or is it actually better to produce the stuff in-house? Now, most firms have some combination. Okay. Some things they produce in-house and some things they outsource because, of course, for different components of a production process, you would have very different calculations uh, that would go on here. So it may be cheaper to produce tires in-house, but windshields we can outsource. It may be cheaper to uh, produce everything under one roof. But it, uh, or excuse me, maybe cheaper to produce everything under one roof, but we hire a contractor to do our marketing. So there's different ways that you can weigh this out. So this is transaction cost economics, and it explains a lot about why you would even engage in outsourcing or offshoring. So if you ever wonder when you hear politicians bemoaning outsourcing and offshoring here in the United States, think about why the company would even do that to begin with. Look at the total cost of the transaction. Great. I am going to continue our discussion. Uh, we'll look at the history of um, labor unions, uh, equal opportunity, and civil rights. Uh, should be a pretty interesting lecture, and I'll see you then.